A company's earnings are the toughest part of a business to value because of the consistently changing future outlook. That's why in this video, I'm going to be going over the most reliable method for valuing a business's earnings. The earnings power value model uses historical data to value a business's operations today in order to determine a reasonable price to pay for the business. Hey everybody, my name is Aaron. I'm a value investor and trader, and welcome back to the Value Investor Playbook. Now the first step in this model is to find the normalized operating profits. And the way that you do this is you take the company's historical operating profit margin, you wanna use at least a 10 year average of operating profits, and then you're gonna multiply that by the current sales. And I find that the more years that you use, the better. And at the very least, you wanna include a past recession. So I like to go back to the Great Recession to see how a company's operations were affected during that period. And looking at Disney, we can see that their revenues took about a $1.6 billion hit while their operating profit also was affected. However, they were still able to maintain an operating margin of 18.5%, which is above average, especially for a company the size of Disney. Now, looking at the graph, we can also see that in 2019, their revenues rose dramatically by about 10 billion while their operating profit fell. And the reason for this is their recent acquisition of 20th Century Fox. And with that acquisition, they were able to increase their ownership in Hulu to 60% which meant that they could now consolidate their earnings into their income statement. So that's why you're seeing an increase in revenues. However, because Hulu is still a young company, they're not as operationally efficient as Disney. So that's why you saw the operating profit fall. However, looking forward into the future, it's likely that Disney, given their rich history of making successful acquisitions, is going to be able to instill some cost-cutting measures in order to increase the operating profit of the Hulu acquisition. So for that reason, I'm going to stick to using the average operating profit of 24%, since Disney has shown the ability to acquire, implement cost-cutting measures, and increase the profitability of their acquisitions. Now to get an idea of why the Disney business is so successful, we're going to have to take a look at their business segments. So the first business segment that we're going to look at is their media networks. And there are three key features to this business segment that make it so successful. So Disney, ESPN, FX, National Geographic, and Freeform all have around 80 to 90 million subscribers within the US. And given that the US has 120 million television households, that gives them about a 66% penetration of that market. And in addition to that, depending on the network, they have around 100 to 200 million international subscribers. So that attracts advertisers because they're able to advertise to a very large and captive audience. And now something that's special about the ABC network is that it reaches approximately 100% of US television households, which increases Disney's power with advertisers. And the second feature that makes this business segment so successful is that they're able to capture an international audience. So specifically within the National Geographic and ESPN uh, network, sports and nature are able to transcend international boundaries and be consumed by international audiences because everybody around the world can connect with nature and sports. And this gives them a lot of power and the ability to continually grow their revenues since they're able to expand their international audience and attract more advertising dollars towards their networks. So the third and final feature that makes this segment so successful is that they have a diverse age range. So the Disney Channel attracts advertisements that are catered towards younger audiences, while things like ESPN, ABC, and National Geographic attract advertisements for a more mature audience. And this gives them a lot of stability in their revenues because advertisers are always going to be looking to, to advertise to a specific market and Disney's media networks are able to capture all age ranges. Now the next business segment that we're going to be taking a look at is their studio entertainment. And this is by far their most important and powerful business segment because it's what drives the demand for Disney products. Now they own some of the most well-known production studios in the world and with that comes the ownership of classic films. So the Walt Disney Studios has intellectual property rights on films like The Lion King and Aladdin. Pixar has films like Toy Story. Marvel has The Avengers. Lucasfilms has Star Wars. And it's very important that Disney owns the intellectual property of this because it allows them to have sole ownership over the distribution of these movies. And additionally, with their recent acquisition of 20th Century Fox, they are able to increase their film portfolio by 2,000 films. And now ownership of the intellectual property for these movies is what creates the intergenerational demand for Disney products. And the reason for this is because their classic movies are able to transcend time because of their simple messages and easy to consume format. 
In addition to that, they're also able to revamp older stories to fit the viewing standards of a new generation. And a good example of that is how they recently remade The Lion King so that it could fit the viewing standards of the current generation. Now the second feature of this business segment that makes it so successful is that it's able to capture international audiences. Things like cartoons and superheroes are very easily adapted for and accepted by international audiences and for that reason it gives them the ability to continually grow outside of the United States. And for an entertainment company, especially one the size of Disney, it's very important to be able to capture international audiences because the United States is a very limited market with only 350 million viewers. Whereas outside of the United States, there's approximately 7 billion additional users who are interested in consuming Disney content. So this is why this business segment is so crucial and important to Disney's success because they're able to transcend not only intergenerational barriers, but also international barriers. Now their next business segment is parks and experiences and products. Now the most brilliant aspect to this business segment is that they're able to benefit from their studio production to advertise and promote these products and experiences. So where a normal theme park or cruise line or resort would have to spend a lot of advertising dollars, their movies already do a lot of the advertising for them. And now there's three crucial aspects to this business segment that make it so successful. The first is that they're able to create an intergenerational demand for their experiences in the same way that they do for their movies. And the reason why is because when you're a kid and you visit Disneyland or Walt Disney World, which are now iconic destinations for families, you want to bring your family to the same place so that they can experience what you did as a, as a kid. And the second is the efficiency that they have with their studio production and, and media networks. And this allows them to advertise and promote these parts and experiences for a lower cost than what most competitors would, would be able to. The final aspect that makes this business segment so successful is that it allows viewers and audiences to step into their favorite worlds. And now this is a very unique experience to Disney and it's one that provides them with a lot of stability in terms of their revenues. And although currently with what's going on with the coronavirus, you're going to see a, a large decrease in revenues from this business segment in the long run, given how iconic Disneyland, Walt Disney World and Walt Disney Store is, it's likely that it's going to recover and people are going to continue to want to come and visit Disneyland, Walt Disney World. And it's actually something we saw recently when Shanghai reopened with their Walt Disney Resort. They sold out within the first day. So for that reason, the parks and experiences, although it's going to take um, a hit this year, and it's going to continue to generate above average returns into the future. Now their final business segment is their direct to consumer and international. And then what's so powerful about this business segment is that it lowers the barrier for international and domestic users to consume their content. Instead of having to have a satellite or cable subscription, you're able to consume their content with just an internet connection. And in addition to that, they're able to bundle together all of these services into one low cost offer, which gives them the ability to capture a larger audience than most streaming networks would be able to. And finally, the most important aspect to this business segment is that they own the intellectual property to the Disney movies and the Hulu content. Intellectual property is the most important aspect because it gives them the sole distribution rights to the content that they have there. So if viewers want to be watching Disney content, the only place they can go is Disney Plus now. So now, now that we know why they're so stable, we're able to make the assumption that the business will be able to continue to operate at the current levels of profitability. And now this is very important for the adjusted earnings or the no growth free cash flows, because if you're going to be valuing the company and, their, or, and you expect that their profitability is going to drop in the future, you're going to be overvaluing the company's earnings. So for that reason, you want to make sure that the business will be able to continue operating at the current levels of profitability. And now to find the no growth free cash flows, you have to make a few adjustments after finding the normalized operating profit. The first is going to be the one time adjustment. Now the one time adjustment includes any abnormal one time charges to the company. So something like restructuring charges or foreign exchange losses. And when you're finding the normalized operating profit, you want to mitigate any of those abnormal one time charges and you're going to make up for them in your one time adjustment. So if, if, the operating profit figure in your normalized operating profit model takes into account a nor abnormal one-time charge. You want to make sure to subtract that charge and then you're going to be taking it away in the one-time adjustment for the company. And the way that you find is you're going to sum the uh, one-time adjustments over a five to ten year period and you're going to divide it by the sum of sales. And the reason why is you want to find how much that company on average is docked by, by abnormal one-time charges and you want to multiply it by the current sales. And so for Disney, the one-time charge was $1.6 billion. And I divided that by the sum of the sales over the same period to get the one-time adjustment of $180 million. 
Now this led me to an adjusted EBIT after which I took the marginal tax, which helped me arrive at the adjusted no plat. Next, you wanna take out zero growth capital expenditures, add back depreciation and amortization, and also add back any earnings that the company is receiving from their non-consolidated subsidiaries. And now to find the zero growth capital expenditure, in the long run, the depreciation and amortization is going to equal the zero growth capex. And the reason why is because as those assets are depreciated, the company is gonna to have to replace them to continue operating at its current capacity. So the calculation to find the zero growth capex is the actual capex minus the property plan and equipment divided by sales times the change in sales. Now, if this figure doesn't return an amount within five to 10% of the depreciation and amortization figure, you should just make the zero growth capex equal the depreciation and amortization expense. And you'll see for Disney, that's what I did. Because they had such a dramatic increase in sales this year, I wasn't able to get an accurate figure using that formula. So I just said that zero growth capex is going to equal the amortization depreciation. And now actually looking at their income statement, you can see that their depreciation amortization was 4.1 billion and their total capital expenditures are 4.8 billion. So that 700 million is actually the difference in what Disney is expending on growth. So that gives us a lot of confidence that their zero growth capex is gonna be somewhere around their depreciation and amortization expense. Now next you wanna make an adjustment for non-consolidated subsidiaries, otherwise known as investments and advances. And you wanna add back the earnings the business owns from its non-consolidated ownership and business. And now this is gonna be different from the balance sheet value that you have for the investments and advances. And you only wanna include what the company has told you that their investments and advances have produced in the last five or 10 years. And I'll usually take the five to 10 year average of the profit owned by the business. Or if the acquisition was made recently, I'll just take the earnings that the, the investment had provided the company with that year. So finally, once you find the no growth free cash flow, what you want to do is you want to find the perpetuity value of that no growth free cash flow. And this is where the earnings power value differs from a discounted cash flow because you're going to be finding the value of a company's earnings based on today's earnings as if they're not going to grow and they'll just continue on to infinity. And the reason why is because you want to eliminate any mistakes that you could make when you're valuing the growth of a company. And as we know, the growth of a company is the most unpredictable element in valuing a business. So for that reason, the earnings power value focuses on the current earnings value as if it's going to continue indefinitely into the future. So that is why you're going to take the no growth free cash flow and divide it by the WAC to find the perpetuity value of the company's earnings power. So once you do that, you want to find the value of equity for the company. And the way that you do that is you add back any cash, investments and advances, excess real estate or overfunded pension, because those are all additional assets which are gonna to add to the equity value of the company. And then you wanna subtract any non-controlling interest and debt from the company. So that includes short-term debt, the value of operating leases, long-term debt, preferred stock, underfunded pension, minority interest and employee stock options. You're gonna to wanna to take these values from the net asset value model that you calculated. And if you haven't done a net asset value model, then you can take these from the balance sheet. However, I do recommend doing a net asset value model before you do an earnings power value model. So then you can compare the value of the company's assets to the company's earnings power. And I'm gonna be covering how you can do this comparison to find the intrinsic value of a company in a future video. So now for Disney, we have the earnings power value of 241 billion, and we divide that by the shares outstanding to get a final share price of $135 per share. Now this is significantly higher than the net asset value of Disney if you watch my previous video. And the reason why is because Disney has a sustainable competitive advantage. And this allows them to generate above average market returns on their invested capital, which is why their net asset value is gonna be less than their earnings power value. So that's it for this video. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions about how I use this model, please leave them in the comment section below. If you want to use the model that I use, I've shared that on my Facebook group and I have the link to that group down below. If you like my content, please like and subscribe and I look forward to making my next video for you guys.